I think uh, we should get started here. Uh, if you have any soda cans, could you open them now so that we don't open them in the middle of, uh, I guess everybody's got bottled water, so that's... Uh, uh, so I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our speaker uh, for today, uh, Mamadou Sek. Uh, he is an assistant professor with tenure uh, in the Department of Systems Engineering within the faculty, is it up here? Within the faculty of Technology, Policy, and Management. So it's, uh, so policy is in there and management as well as technology uh, at uh, Delft uh, University of Technology uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, been there since 2007, was it? Uh, or actually, there was a period in industry. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, his uh, PhD is from uh, is in mathematics and informatics at the University of Paul Cezanne in Marseille, France. So uh, I think all of your degrees are in France from France, uh, and uh, actually with highest honors. So so he's been accumulating honors uh, through this period. Uh, so, uh, and uh, it's been interesting to learn uh, the, the Dutch model for universities. Uh, so they're very heavily into projects and uh, students work uh, either with industry or with government agencies on very significant projects uh, uh, at Delft. Uh, 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 Mamadou is, is very interesting to us uh, because we are wrestling with uh, model-based systems engineering and bringing that into our curriculum. Uh, uh, Mamadou comes from a very strong tradition of uh, systems theory and, and model-based systems engineering. Uh, and so we've asked him to, to give his perspective on that uh, for us. Uh, it, help, it will, I think, help clarify our thinking as to where we want to take the systems engineering program. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, and we have about an hour here. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Um, yes, so uh, um, I'll talk to you today about models in systems engineering. Um, uh, well, but before I start the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Delft University of Technology. So Delft is... Uh, a technical university in southern Holland. Um, it was founded in 1842 uh, by King William II of Holland. Uh, it is the largest technical university in the Netherlands with uh, over 15,000 students. Uh, we have eight faculties, uh, and those eight faculties offer uh, 16 bachelor's courses and over 40 master programs. So these are the faculties that we have. We have a faculty of architecture, electrical engineering, uh, applied sciences, so that more biosciences, civil engineering, aerospace engineering, uh, technology, policy and management, industrial design, and mechanical and maritime engineering. Um, and as Peter just said, I'm from the technology, policy and management department. Uh, or faculty, which is the most recent one, and uh, it was designed in the spirit of uh, interdisciplinarity. So we have various specialized faculties, and our faculty is there to bridge between those different uh, uh, specialized technical uh, specialties, and we focus on transdisciplinary projects, sustainability, uh, future energy networks, uh, and so on. Okay. And uh, about technology policy and management. So our goal is to contribute sustainable solutions to complex socio-technical problems. So we have social scientists, uh, law specialists, uh, so humanities and technology together. And we try to solve problems either through analysis or design. Okay. And our systems engineering department is one of the four uh, departments within this faculty. So uh, we are approximately close to 30 uh, faculty members, uh, four full professors, a number of associate and assistant professors, also quite a sizable number of uh, PhDs and uh, graduate students. Um, and my research interest within that faculty of systems, that department of systems engineering is 
model-based systems engineering. So uh, uh, my training has been in modeling and simulation, uh, and within that systems engineering uh, department, I try to see how, system, how systems modeling and simulation can contribute to better, uh, more formal and uh, more rigorous systems engineering. So uh, the presentation today will be <coughs> about model-based systems engineering. I will first uh, give a short introduction of what I understand by model-based systems engineering. And then from more general topics to some things more specific, I will start with uh, multi-perspective problem definition. So if we have problems uh, that um, connect different fields of knowledge, how can we build models for such problems? Um, then I'll talk a little bit about methodologies. How can we s explore the solution space of a complex problem with models? And then something more specific uh, about uh, bridging the gap between discrete and continuous systems representations using constraints and st state diagram representations. And then I hope that at the end we'll have some discussion about uh, what I've talked about. Okay. So, uh, about uh, model-based systems engineering. First, uh, I think systems engineering is a transdisciplinary approach. So I don't use interdisciplinary. Uh, I think transdisciplinar transdisciplinarity is more characteristic of systems engineering. Uh, by transdisciplinary, I mean that we don't want to uh, make different domains interoperate, but we want to create... Uh, <coughs> languages and representations that are shared by all uh, disciplines. So it's not just about simply bridging, bridging the gaps, but we want to create a discipline that is shared by all engineering uh, fields. And the goal of it is to support the development of complex socio-technical systems. So it's not just about designing um, uh, a mechanical equipment or electronic equipment, but uh, we also need to take into consideration the social and ecological aspect. So systems engineering goes beyond the uh, design of the physical thing, but we want to include uh, the social environment around it. And, of course, those systems have a scope that goes beyond the boundaries of traditional and scientific engineering disciplines. Uh, if that was not the case, then uh, we would not need systems engineering. Uh, we have mechanical and other engineers who are very specialized and who know how to design those technical systems. So systems engineering becomes useful when we want to design for sustainability. We want to design urban systems, larger systems that require all kinds of knowledge. And systems engineering is in a support role. So it is here to support activities such as problem definitions, elicitation of needs, uh, design, development, operation. And it does that in a systematic way. So uh, in the tradition of systems engineering, you often find process models, methodologies, life cycles. So uh, we want to support those activities in a systematic way so that it can be taught. And systems engineering also must satisfy objectives uh, that are defined in a value system, and that value system is negotiated between stakeholders. So. Uh, in this way, it is really difficult to, to talk about systems engineering in an optimizing way. So it is not that we have a clear definition of what the goal is. That goal has to be negotiated with, between the parties involved in the systems engineering project. So since uh, systems engineering is a lot about uh, bridging the gap between disciplines, between uh, stakeholders, between engineering phases, uh, the main problem of it is integration or interoperability. Uh, so integration is more, if we think about it, uh, in a, uh, as a transdiscipline, and interoperability is if we think about it as an interdiscipline. Okay. So we want to integrate or interoperate between stakeholders who have different worldviews, uh, disciplines who have different theories, uh, different models, and engineering phases which have different... Um, objectives. And traditionally, the burden of integration was placed on documents. So uh, in a traditional systems engineering project, you would have system documentation trees, requirement documents, performance specifications, uh, and so on. So a lot of documents 
used to support systems engineering projects. But supporting these complex tasks with documents has some limitations. So uh, documents can be interpreted uh, in an ambiguous way and so on. So more and more people think that models are better to support this integration role. So that's where model-based systems engineering is coming from. So uh, supporting the integration role of systems engineering using models. Now, if we say that models have to replace documents for integration, we need to understand what models are. So, um, actually, there is not an easy definition of what a model is. Thinking about it a little bit, uh, I chose this definition. So, a model is just anything uh, which has enough resemblance with another thing to the extent that it may become more convenient to use the model in order to understand or discover a property of the real thing that we're interested in. Okay? So actually we cannot point at something and say this is a model except if we say what is it a model of. So diagrams and such, what we generally call modeling languages are not modeling languages, they are only modeling languages if we can show that they have that modeling relation with the thing that they are purported to model. So uh, that idea is very well represented by this diagram that I took from uh, Robert Rosen, who was a theoretical biologist. And he showed this modeling relation. So we have a natural system, the object of interest. Uh, but we have some empirical uh, limitations to study this object, either for ethical reasons or because it's a distant system, or it's even a system that doesn't exist. Uh, but we have some questions about it. And we know that this uh, natural system uh, behaves according to some causal phenomena, some laws of nature. So we have to encode that natural system into a formal system, which is a mathematical representation. And within that mathematical rep representation, we have some uh, formulas, some axioms, and we can derive some logical implications from the definition. And based on that, we can decode the meaning that we have from this formal system back into the natural system and understand something about it. Okay? So, uh, from this understanding, he stated that modeling is the essence of science and the habitat of all epistemology, <coughs> meaning that actually we cannot know anything if it were not for models. So, our scientific theories, uh, um, um, and the mice that we use in biological laboratories, all those things are models. We have some empirical limitations with regard to our object of uh, interest, and we need to have another system which is easier to manipulate, and from that manipulation we learn something about the system that we're interested about. Okay, so then what is the difference between documents and models? Uh, Documents will convey information, but in a passive way. So documents generally have a syntax, um, and it is the reader's responsibility from the syntax to interpret what the document is about and to create an implicit mental model from which they will learn something. Okay? So um, if things are this way, then what we understand from documents will only be in our own minds. So it's really difficult if we have a large team to make sure that we share the same understanding. So documents have this limitation that uh, we cannot make sure that what I transmit or what I transfer is understood by the person who receives it. On the other hand, models will convey not just information but knowledge because they have a formal syntax and also uh, an execution semantics that is uh, embedded into the definition of the model. So models have a fixed, abstract, and concrete syntax. They have an execution semantics that is provided. So if I have a differential equation, I know that uh, if it is a model of something, if I need to know what will be the future state of the system, I know that I can integrate that equation. So I can derive new meaning from uh, what is uh, uh, fixedly defined in the syntax of the model. So models can be analyzed and simulated to derive new knowledge. Also, very important models can be transformed and related with other models. Okay. So this is the benefit of models compared to documents, and this is why model-based systems engineering is something that uh, has potential. 
Another interesting feature of models is that uh, models are located in a hierarchy of other models. So, uh, for example, if I draw a UML model, that UML model is an instance of the UML meta model, which, instance, which itself is an instance of the MOF meta model. Okay? So, uh, models can always be understood in terms of the model that is above them. Okay? So, I have a hierarchy of meta models. Um, so, an example of that, uh, this is a project that our, one of our uh, PhD students is currently doing. Um, we want to create simulation code in a model-driven way. So, we want to design simulations without writing any line of code. So, for that, uh, we define a generic modeling and simulation meta-model, which contains concepts such as states, transitions, components, relations. And then from that meta model, we create instances. So, and those instances correspond to different phases of the modeling and simulation life cycle. So we have a specific meta model for conceptual modeling. We have a specific meta model for simulation specification. And we have a specific meta model for simulation implementation. And we have also the Java meta model, which can generate code. So those three meta those different meta models are related to the higher order meta model. And then when we want to create a simulation, we just create instances of these meta models, and we can define transformation rules that can take this conceptual model and write it in terms of uh, a specification meta model and so on until we obtain uh, the final executable code. So that's what we show here. As an example, uh, um, we made a case for an um, enterprise engineering uh, project. So we used the business process modeling notation as the conceptual meta model. We used devs as the specification meta model. And we used our devs simulator diesel as the execution implementation meta model. And we defined generic transformation rules between one and the other meta model. Um, so this shows actually the same thing with the different roles of the people who do that. So the problem owner will give us requirements about the business process. Uh, the conceptual modeler makes this uh, conceptual model based on the conceptual meta model and so on. So the BPMN meta model is here defined, but I will not get into the details of it. But from that meta model, we can obtain a modeling environment in which we can design a BPMN uh, diagram. Then we have the devs meta model. So that devs meta model has components, input, output ports, uh, coupling relations, uh, transition functions, and so on. So the classical uh, state diagram constructs. And then. Many of us aren't familiar with the acronym DEVS. Okay, DEVS okay. is uh, an acronym for Discrete Event System Specification. So it's a system theoretical uh, formalism to, 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 to simulate discrete systems. Okay. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about DEVS a bit more in detail later on. So now using the ATLAS transformation language, we can define transformation rules from BPMN to DEVS. And then our modeling environment will create this DEVS model simply from the uh, conceptual model that was defined before. Uh, and then we take that, that specification, then we have also some code for transforming uh, the specification into Java code. So it defines, it creates Java code that can be interpreted by our simulator. And as a result, we can simulate the, the business process. And for example, this is the output of uh, um, a business process with a queue, and we can obtain information about the queue length or the waiting time or similar things. Yeah? So is the Java code automatically generated when you have the diagrams laid out? Right. The... Yeah. So uh, we have the diagrams that we defined there. Mm -hmm. And for each component, 
in the transformation library, we define a mapping to a, a Java construct. So we say that, uh, for example, if you have an atomic model, it corresponds to a class which has these uh, attributes and so on. So we also have a library of components stored somewhere, and the transformation code will just do a one-to-one -one mapping or will map some concepts here into some specific code there. Yeah. Could you explain why, why Java was chosen in particular uh, as a key language? Um, well, Java was chosen because when I, when I arrived at TU Delft, they already started using uh, Java as the simulation language. So, uh, so we, we went with that. So there is no deep uh, reason for using Java. Uh, yeah, Java is, a, uh, is an object-oriented language, and it's very easy to learn. And uh, we find it easy to teach to our, to our students than uh, other similar languages. So yeah, I was just curious because yeah. there's uh, a number of other like Right. In depth libraries, you might be able to tie into it with other right. languages. And, uh, yeah, but I don't think, uh, yeah, it, the same could have been done with C Sharp or with any other uh, other language. So Java is there just for legacy reasons. We that's what we've been using, so we keep using it. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So from concept to executable code you can use model driven a model driven approach so this is the essence of uh, model based systems engineering uh, having models to design uh, your systems and being able to evaluate those systems with simulation um, if you want some more details on this uh, our phd student denise chetinkaya is the one who is doing this and she has uh, a few uh, papers on our web page where more details can be found on this. Okay, something else that I uh, wanted to talk about is actually when we talk about model-based systems engineering, the concept of system itself is a bit obscure. We, we don't really know what we're talking about uh, because system can be understood in terms of, uh, so here I use the framework of the four causes of Aristotle. So. For any system, we have a material cause, a formal cause, an efficient cause, and a final cause. So the material cause of system, it is the technology. What are systems made of? So systems can be understood in terms of the technology that are, they are made of. Uh, systems can also be understood in terms of their formal cause, meaning uh, what mathematical abstractions uh, can we use to describe systems. We also have the efficient cause of it, and I would consider that to be the in engineering principles that drive systems engineering. So uh, we can find that in the works, for example, of Andrew Sage or the process models of Incosa. And the final cause of systems is related to ethics and boundary critics. So what is the system supposed to achieve in the real world? So when we talk about model-based systems engineering, we should not just focus on uh, representation, but we should think about how does this representation fit with the technologies that they are purported to represent, uh, how do these representations fit with systems methodology, and how can these representations help us achieve um, ethical systems or systems that are sustainable. So we need to consider all these aspects of systems. Excuse me, do you distinguish between model and representation? Um, well, I would say that uh, all representations are not models, but models have to be representations. So I think there is a distinction. Mo model is more constrained as re uh, than representation. That's how I would understand it. So models represent things, but not any representation is a model. For a representation to be a model, it needs to have a formal syntax and a formal semantics. So a painting that represents um, a tree or something, I would not call that a model because uh, it doesn't have a formal syntax. So I cannot interpret it and learn something about the tree from it. So that's, that's my definition that I use. Would you believe that models are existential and must be representable? Hmm. As, for example, the real numbers. 
which may be represented by the Roman system, the deanery system, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that, 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 that's a philosophical question. I would, it depends on whether you are an idealist or a realist, actually. I'm just trying to straighten out uh -huh. what your words mean. What? I'm just trying to yeah. understand what your words mean. Yeah. Model versus representation. Yeah. So I think that models, uh, that models are representations, but they are representations that have extra qualities. <coughs> so models need to have a syntax and a semantics. Not all representations are models. So that's, that's the definition that I adhere to. Um, now, what the model represent is out there. So actually everything that we manipulate is models, basically. If we, if we want to learn something, if we want to do science, we do it with models. So we don't have really access to the material, the real world. So it's out there. We create models of that and we manipulate them for the purpose of science. So uh, our theories, our equations are not the real thing. We have to consider them as models that we create and that are useful for the purpose of <coughs> discovering something from reality. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, something else about uh, technology. These two cars look very much alike. So these are, this is a new model uh, from Toyota. But uh, this one is the electric version and this one is the traditional fuel-based version. And they look very much alike. Um, visually. Uh, and clearly this one has been designed based on that one. So uh, when we want to design a new electric car, we don't start from, from scratch. So uh, what I mean by this slide is that systems that we design are evolved systems. So uh, we don't have a greenfield situation in which we start from scratch and we design the new system <coughs> completely as we would like it to be. We are very much constrained by what is already existing. Uh, and any time we design such a car, actually, we are also we should be wary of the energy storage issue. And uh, is our smart grid ready for uh, accepting a sizable number <coughs> of these cars? And how does this car fit into the mobility market? Should we, uh, if we are going for sustainability, should we design such electric cars, or should we design more public transportation? Uh, and also, is our industrial system ready for designing, for producing, mass producing such things? Um, so, yeah, so the systems that we designed are fitting into a broader, more complex system. And uh, we don't ever have the situation where we, are, where we are in a greenfield situation. So, design should, systems engineering methodology should also uh, recognize this fact. So, there is no greenfield situation, there is no optimality in design, so we design with a lot of constraints that are pre-existent. A lot of the features of the systems that we designed are deeply entrenched, so we use pre-existing knowledge. And the path, from, the path from problem to solution is not a known path, so when we design model-based systems engineering methodologies, we should leave some space for creativity and emergence in the path from problem to solution. And the fitness of the design artifacts that we have um, depend on multiple boundary situations. So they don't just depend on how the car is, but also is the smart grid ready and so on. Uh, and if we want model-based systems engineering to have the impact that it should have, we should not start it from requirement specification. We should be able to model the context of the problem with our models. Um, an example that I give sometimes is uh, if we compare the Dreamliner to the A380, the, so the Boeing versus the um, uh, Airbus plane, the winner of that fight will, necess will not necessarily be the one who has the best model-based systems engineering approach in-house, but the one who has understood uh, the environment of uh, air transport. So do we need bigger planes or do we need smaller and more efficient planes? So model-based systems engineering to design better systems doesn't start when we decide to design uh, a big plane because the gain, uh, the bigger gain is at the first decision. Do we design 
big planes or do we design smaller and faster or whatever? So that's what this slide was about. To, uh, was about. So um, I'll talk now about problem definition. So we generally say that systems are designed to solve problems. But what actually is a problem? So generally we have a situation, and it's a very complex situation. We have different stakeholders around it. And those stakeholders have different powers, uh, different perceptions, different interests, different values. And uh, some of them are satisfied, and some of them are neutral. Others are dissatisfied with the situation. And each of them will consider a few variables as the variables responsible for the dissatisfaction with the situation. So we will say that we have a problem when, in an aggregate sense, different actors consider that they're dissatisfied with an existing or a predicted situation. And of course, um, that appraisal of the problem is not purely rational. So. Uh, is whenever somebody says there is a problem, there is an aff effective dimension to it. Uh, uh, and if there is an effective and psychological dimension to it, you will have different attitudes, such as people will shift the blame of the problem from one actor to the other. So generally, when there is a problem, people think that uh, the problem does not come from the variables that I control, but rather from the variables that somebody else controls. Uh, some people can be overwhelmed by the problem and deny it and consider that everything is fine. And some people will have a tunneling uh, attitude and only focus on the, the, uh, what they consider to be the problem and disregard anything else that could be uh, fine as well. So outside of this psychological aspect, you also have a theoretical aspect. So uh, the same situation can be described according to different theories. So uh, in the past summer, I, I was uh, writing a proposal for um, urban planning, and it had a sociological dimension to it. So uh, we were looking at what sociological theory should we use to um, describe that urban planning problem. Uh, so uh, I didn't have much background in sociology, but when you start reading it, you realize that it's a complete mess. Some people uh, consider societies as conflict situations where you have classes that uh, are fighting for power. You have people who are functionalists and consider that society is made of, um, let's say, institutions that have a functional role. And you also have symbolic interactionists who would think that society is made of individual actors uh, that exchange meaning with each other. So those different theoretical perspectives are completely non-isomorphic. So if you use one of, the, one of these, you completely reject the other one. Um, and also sometimes you have cross-cutting worldviews. So some people take a bit of a conflict idea and a bit of functionalist ideas and mix them together, and that's their worldview. So if you want to simulate the environment of a complex problem, uh, we are very quickly uh, confronted with this situation where we don't really know what theory we should <coughs> adopt to describe the system. Um, so in classical system theory, uh, George Clear proposed that there are four levels at which you can know a system. So you have the source system where you distinguish the variables. So you define the variables uh, that are relevant for understanding this system. Then you have a data level where you can uh, define time series with those variables. Then you have a generative system where you can create a time invariant representation that can reproduce the same data. You have a structure level <coughs> where these generative systems can be coupled with each other. So this was his system framework. But actually, if you confront this with this idea, you see that the classical system frameworks are not expressive enough. Uh, because uh, if we are dealing with a situation where we have a symbolic interactionist and a functionalist, uh, we don't have the same variables. So. Um, we cannot express the system in such a neat hierarchy. So we need an extra layer that identifies, actually, uh, how those different perspectives can be related to each other. So it means that if we want to simulate really complex systems, we have to make them multi-aspect systems or multi-perspective systems. So 
Systems are not just made of structures, but structures are actually parts of perspectives which are not actually in reality, but which are models of reality. So, um, uh, what I mean by that is that institutions or uh, so so sociological classes are things in our mind as sociological theoreticians, but not things out there. So, if we want to simulate reality, we need to be able to combine different perspectives. So, going back to the initial modeling relation that I showed at the beginning, we need to create something more complex, actually. So, we have one natural system, but we have different formal systems that are uh, different representations for the same natural system, and we need to create mapping relations between those formal systems. So, it means that we don't adopt a realist perspective, but we rather take an idealist perspective. We have different theories for the same system, and each of them has some merit, and we need to uh, uh, map between them. <coughs> so, uh, if we use some theories in philosophy of science, uh, especially the work by Nagel and Hempel, we can know, we can um, realize how uh, theory reduction can be done. So, how can aspect models be bridged with each other? So. There is a lot of work in philosophy of science that can be used to see how we relate these models together. So we use those theories and we create, we extended the DEVS formalism to uh, allow it to represent um, multi-perspective systems. So, well, this is not very understandable, but you'll see the, um, the reference, so you can uh, look at the paper for more detailed understanding. But I will... Uh, explain the gist of it through an example. So, uh, we had a project where we needed to uh, um, help uh, the military to design this, uh, the strategy for peacekeeping. So, there is a um, conflict situation and we want to design the best peacekeeping strategy. So, uh, we need troops and we need to uh, 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 define rounds around a certain uh, conflict city and uh, by being present, we, uh, uh, we make sure that uh, the different factions will not attack each other, and so on. So if we look at that as a systems problem, uh, how can we solve that? So um, by doing different interviews, we realized that there are two sociological perspectives that were dominant there. Some people saw it um, as we have two communities, and each one has... Uh, different ideologies that dominate in it, and we could model that using a certain uh, diffusion model. And other people saw the situation in a very individualistic uh, way. So we have some activists, some terrorists that are running around and trying to do terrorist actions. And uh, we also had civilians that had nothing to do with that. So this perspective was very individualist in the sense that it was distinguishing different agents doing different things. And this one only considered communities as an aggregate uh, with ideologies flowing within those communities. Uh, and then we thought about how can we map this and that level. So how do actions by civilians and activists influence the um, ideologies of the community at large? And how does the ideology of the community uh, influence the propensity of activists to commit terrorist actions, for example. Uh, so, for the first model, so the uh, aggregate model, we used uh, the opposing forces diffusion model by Myers and Olivers. So, we did not develop these models, but some social scientists know how to model these things. And for the uh, individual models, we created some artificial agents uh, that have some... Uh, uh, reasoning modules and some behavioral modules where they can move on a terrain and do different activities. And we also created an, an interaction mm -hmm. matrix between those different layers. And we managed to simulate the system and, uh, for example, being able to predict uh, on a timeline what will be the probability of having a terrorist action if we only do a round once a day or things like that. Of course, the validity of the model as such is something that needs to be talked about. But what I want to talk about in this model is that we can really simulate complex systems with sociological ideas and so on and implement it formally in, uh, in depth and mathematical models. Yeah? I, 
uh, three slides back, if, yeah. if you wouldn't mind. Yes. Yeah, this, this one right here. The, right. Um, uh, so like the, the common control models and things of that nature, which, where, where did those come from, or they were just representations for, for your particular study? Where, uh, yeah, the, the ones that you used in, in this study, were, did they, were they um, already validated through, uh, through other means, or were they ones that you just used, used for the study? Just, just curious. Right. These are the ones that I used for the study. So, okay. uh, uh, yeah, so... You just uh, need some representation in order to right. see the higher level thing. Right. Okay. So, um, it's a state diagram. We have uh, different states that correspond to actions by the different uh, agents. And uh, we have some input and output ports that represent what they can perceive and what actions they can operate on the terrain. Yeah. So this was used in a game session to train, for example, military. And, okay, what happens if the general decides to use a larger patrol? Uh, what impact could it potentially have? And so on. Thank you. So, um, so uh, more detail can be found here in a paper called Multi-Perspective Modeling of Complex Phenomena in a computational uh, uh, and operational mathematical theory. So what I meant by showing this is that uh, model-based systems engineering has a potential prior to requirements formulation. We shouldn't start, because SysML and so on, they start model-based systems engineering at the requirements formulation stage. But I think uh, the biggest problem in <coughs> systems engineering are actually before we specify requirements understanding the context. And that context is generally a complex context with different theoretical views that compete. So uh, we should try to find modeling methodologies before requirements formulation. Um, and we should also uh, try to express problems as hypotheses, falsifiable hypotheses that come from our models, where we say, uh, for example, if we don't have uh, a patrol that runs twice every hour in the city, then we will have more, uh, uh, more terrorist actions uh, happening. And then that would be our requirement. So uh, the requirement that says uh, um, our peacekeeping mission should uh, patrol the city twice every hour should not come from, um, I mean, our imagination, but should come from models, and we should be able to falsify it and make sure that this is the problem before we try to design a system that can uh, solve it. So intensive attempts of problem falsification should precede, should precede the requirements formulation for a solution. And uh, those requirements, as I said, we should express them as invariants in the larger <coughs> system, so not just in the system to be designed but fitting the system into a larger system. Okay. So something more practical uh, now about solution space exploration. So the objective for this project is to embed modeling in the systems engineering methodology uh, and to make systems engineering stakeholders effective models themselves. So model-based uh, model systems engineering will not be effective um, if you have a team of systems engineers who are modelers, who will do the modeling work? You need to bring those modeling uh, techniques in the hands of the designers, real-life designers. Okay? So if you design a container terminal, uh, the civil engineer in the container terminal should be the one who is applying model-based systems engineering. So we shouldn't have external consultants to be the model-based systems engineers. Um, we have to make this methodology cost-effective uh, because if building the models takes more time than doing it in the traditional way, then model-based systems engineering will never take off. So we need to find ways to make this cost-effective. And we need a way of structuring the modeling process and reducing its complexity. So uh, this is uh, a project that we did for uh, the port of Rotterdam. So there are designers of container terminals. And they generally use computer-aided design tools like AutoCAD to design the layout of the terminal. So uh, we said, okay, we want to make modeling uh, available to those people, so we have to find a way to express our models in AutoCAD and finding automatic transformations through meta-models to generate simulation models from those things. So uh, 
We had AutoCAD components for cranes, for uh, old equipment that are in container terminals. For each of those components, we had devs components that were pre-specified. Um, we also had visualization components that were pre-specified for that so that they could see the consequence of their designs. Um, and then also, of course, statistical output from the simulation models. Um, so, if you want to have model-based systems engineering, we have to adapt to how people design systems. So, when you design a container terminal, you don't design the whole container terminal at once. So, you have different levels of abstraction through which you go. So, first, you will design the large terminal. So, do you want it to be perpendicular or parallel to the key, for example? So, and that decision has a lot of impact. So, if you have a transshipping container terminal, it's better to have it parallel, whereas when you have an import container terminal, it's better to have it perpendicular for logistical reasons. So you first make these decisions. And then you have to make decisions about, uh, for example, uh, how many cranes do you need on the quay. Okay? And then once you have made that decision, you have to make a decision about how each crane should be designed in detail. So you have different levels of abstraction when you, when you go through the design process. So um, we need to support that type of things. So in order to allow for that, we created an ontology for the container terminal. So a container terminal is made of a, container, of a terminal operating system, of vessel handlers, horizontal transport, and stack handlers. So uh, we separated each aspect of the container terminal. And for each one, we defined different levels of abstraction. So, the terminal operating system could be understood in a very abstract sense or in a very detailed sense with many subcomponents. And each component could be decomposed even further. Okay? So, um, also something important, when you start your design, every decision leads you to a new system, and that system is constraining your performance metrics. So each new design that you make uh, redu adds uh, constraints and reduces your degrees of freedom. So the first decisions that you make will leave a lot of unknown or a lot of uncertainty at the beginning. And as you make more decisions, you're reducing the boundaries of your system. Okay. So um, we uh, implemented those ideas into a new uh, formalism for system design. And then we had uh, um, a CAD interface in which designers could just take components, put them together to represent a container terminal. That container terminal would be uh, uh, generated using an XML file, which will be put into a simulation server, and we can simulate that container terminal and create an animation for it. Uh, we also used a similar approach for urban transport, and I would like to show you um, the model of that uh, of that. Um, um, urban transport model. So this is uh, the tram network of the city uh, of The Hague. Um, so we used a CAD uh, design for the city, and we have some artificial intelligence techniques to infer uh, some meaning from that CAD design. So anytime two tracks are perpendicular, it means that we should have a switch here, and if we have a switch, we should have a traffic light to guard the thing, and so on. So from the CAD design, we can infer a devs model, and that devs model can be used to assess uh, the performance of it. So uh, we have the different stations. So this is, for example, the central station of The Hague. So this is, on the first floor of it, we have trams arriving. And on the lower floor, this is also other tram. Um, So with a discrete event model, we can... Where does it go? 
Okay, well, I saw it earlier, and you see the trains running across. So, <laughs> so you can have a replication of the train behavior in the whole city and uh, analyze the punctuality and all uh, the trans uh, any feature of the transport network that you would like to have. Um, the behavior is generated with a discrete event model, but of course you can uh, interpolate to make the behavior continuous, if you like, for better animation. And uh, yeah, so this is the model of the whole network and it's quite efficient. You can run 24 hours of, tra of tram behavior in 30 minutes, for example. With, uh, and the detail is less than 10 centimeters, so very detailed behavior as well. Okay. So is that potentially expensive to do, you know, for this network simulation? Uh, no, actually, <laughs> initially we had a, a differential equation model for the same system, and when we wanted to be, if, when we wanted it to be as detailed as we wanted, like ten centimeters of detail for the control system, because we wanted to make sure that trams would not collide based on the rules for the traffic lights and so on. Uh, with enough detail, we started to have models that were running slower than real time. If we had in, in um, so in rush hour, the tram network would be slower to simulate than the real tram network. And of course, a simulation becomes useless when it becomes slower than reality. And then we switched to discrete event models. So there are ways to abstract discrete event models uh, to simulate continuous behavior and have the same um, uh, accuracy. So, uh, for example, using quantization techniques or uh, using, for example, polynomial approximation to, to approximate those differential equations, and so on. And by doing that, we managed to go to have it 10 times faster than it was initially. So. Okay. Let's see. Is it? Oh, bottom right. <coughs> the little uh, symbol over here. This one. Yeah. Will it go back to... Okay, so about five minutes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the remarks here was that uh, designers are aware of bounded rationality. They don't design complex systems all at once. They make stepwise decisions. So we need to have that into our our methodologies, meaning that we need to be able to model multiple levels of resolutions and uh, model the design decisions continuously. Uh, the formality of models is not com incompatible with stakeholder involvement. So if we have uh, the appropriate interfaces, so if we use, for example, AutoCAD as our inter modeling interface, we can have models as formal as we like, but uh, the designers will not realize that it's formal and it will not uh, deter them from using those models. So we should not scare people away giving them mathematical models. We should give them the techniques that they generally use and behind the curtain, we should use the proper model transformations. And meta-modeling is very useful for that. Uh, also, uh, uh, UML, SysML are very powerful languages, but we notice that designers want their own domain-specific languages. So uh, we need to create the proper domain-specific languages uh, for the specialists, because they don't want to use class diagrams and block diagrams to design what they do. <coughs> they have a tradition of using some representations, so we have to create the, the same representations for them if we want them to adopt model-based approaches. Um, okay, I will go very quickly through this part. So, uh, this project is to integrate state diagrams and constraints. So, uh, Generally, in, in systems, uh, in dynamic systems, you have three classes of system representations. You have differential equations, you have uh, difference equations or discrete time systems, and you have discrete event systems. Okay? Uh, so generally, uh, the distinction will be made between continuous and discrete, but I think a better distinction is to uh, differentiate between the representations that have one time invariant representation for the whole state space and representations that have piecewise uh, 
uh, representation. So discrete event systems are systems which have multiple time invariant representations and discontinuities in the representation of the system state. So um, some people, for example, Van Kelleuer and Delara have analyzed different representation techniques and they have found out that uh, the dev specification is very generic and expressive and could be used to represent all different uh, discrete system representations. So we can design model-based systems using devs and using translation mechanisms to translate into the other formalisms if people want to use them. Um, so uh, generally this is what is meant by a discrete event system. We have a variable and we have time and the state of the system is piecewise constant. So we have discontinuities, the system changes its state at uh, fixed times and the time between any two events is taken from the set of reals, okay? But uh, this is just a narrow understanding of it. Actually, if we look at this system, we have the same thing. So we have uh, also uh, not piecewise constant, but piecewise linear pieces of the state space, and we have discontinuities. So, and the same can be said also here. So actually, discrete event models could be used to represent continuous systems if we find a way of detecting these moments of discontinuities in the state space. Okay. So, um, let's see, is this necessary? Um, so, this, the state space of the system can be represented as a network where we have variables and we have operators that connect those variables together. Okay, and we have external constants that will influence the system. So. Generally, a transition is just a change in the topology of the network. So, for example, uh, this uh, variable takes this new value. So this is an external transition. So the system has been per perturbed from the environment. A new value is coming to this variable. So that's an external transition. Uh, external transition is something similar. It means that the internal structure of the system has been changed at some point in time. Okay. And, uh, of course, in devs we know that the next state is a function of the previous state and that the time uh, difference can take any value from zero to infinity. Um, so if we were to model the behavior of a tram, like the ones that I showed before, uh, in discrete event specification, uh, we would first define the system boundary. So this tram is sensitive to the light of the traffic light that is ahead of it. So either green or red, and it's also sensitive to the position of the signal. Okay. And it has a number of variables, acceleration, velocity, position, and the braking position of the track. And then we, have a, we make a um, qualitative decomposition of the state space. We say that the tram can be either stopped or accelerating, cruising, or decelerating. And we define the values of the characteristic variables that characterize each of the phases. Of course, these phases are qualitative in the sense that uh, I could say that this tram has only two states stopped or moving, for example. And I would have to define the proper equations that manage the moving phase. The next step is to define the transition, so an external transition. When I'm stopped ahead of the traffic light, when the light gets green, I go to accelerating phase. Okay. So... Uh, so phases are a qualitative partitioning of the state space. Uh, they're generally modeled as an extra variable that we use to label those different parts of the state space. And those state diagrams are very useful for understanding the functional behavior of the system. Generally in SysML that's what we use them for, to understand how the system behaves from outside. And we generally use constraints to express how the system behaves inside. Okay. Now, uh, so, but using those state diagrams is difficult if we want to generate code for complex systems. So in SysML, generally, we use parametrics to generate simulation code. But this is much more understandable for uh, uh, observers of the simulation. So what we try to do here is to create a SysML profile with parameters, constraints, and behavior. 
So constraints define actually the boundaries of those phases, and behavior defines the mathematical relations that happen within that phase. And those phases can be understood in a hierarchical way, and this uh, means actually inheritance plus uh, composition. So the vehicle movement uh, ha is made of acceleration, cruising, deceleration, and stopping, for example. And each of them is made of specific constraints that only operate at the lower level. So with this uh, declarative representation of the state space, the goal was to obtain this automatically. So can we derive uh, functional behavior from uh, structural behavior? So how is structure and behavior related in complex systems? Um, so for that, we defined uh, mathematical formalism uh, that we named phi devs for phase-based devs. Um, for example, if we have a variable uh, and the constraints are defined as inequalities or inequations, if we have a powerful solver enough, we can uh, solve this inequality and we can find the time values where the inequality will start to be uh, violated. And that value is actually equal to the time advance function of a discrete event system. So finding the mapping between uh, the transition function and the solving of the constraint. Um, <coughs> so these are implementation okay. issues. Can so maybe move to right. uh, the summary. Yeah. So using algebraic solvers instead of simulators. So now you have many very strong algebraic solvers that can generate solution for equations in a uh, symbolic and analytical way. So using that, uh, that is better than using uh, discrete event simulation code. So implementation and uh, with those solvers you can regenerate the discrete event behavior using uh, that. And uh, at the Conference for Theory of Modeling and Simulation, there is a paper that describes this approach in more detail. So a summary for what I wanted to say, uh, for model-based systems engineering, we need to integrate continuous and discrete event behavior, have more compact and declarative model specifications. We need to be able to check formal properties of the models. We want to embed systems methodology into our models. Okay? And we want to start before requirements formulation. So this is a bit of what I've said uh, uh, in a very compact way. And for future work, um, um, yes, making research in domain-specific languages uh, and also having technological libraries, so for specific domains, for hydraulics, for uh, mechanics, and so on. Having predefined libraries that we can plug together to create complex systems. Uh, using multi-perspective models to design the right systems and not just focusing on designing the systems right. And re-evaluating mathematical system theory for systems engineering, especially the works of George Clear, Bernard Ziegler, and Wayne Wymore. I find them very, uh, very useful if we want to make model-based systems engineering rigorous enough. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I would like to have a uh, time for question and answer, but I know given some people will be slipping out for other commitments, so before people disappear, uh, I do want to present you with some uh, gifts on behalf of uh, uh, the systems engineering program. So there will be a Cornell mug. It's probably too big for espresso coffee, but uh, in Europe. <laughs> oh. Or just right. <laughs> <laughs> or just, yeah, maybe you could really get charged up. And we hope we've got the right size here for you. It's a uh, Cornell wow. uh, systems engineering uh, t shirt. And you can carry all the stuff with, uh, with the Cornell bag. Thank you. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Very informative. Uh, so, for those of you who can say, we can keep the question and answer uh, period going. So, some questions for Mamadou. Mark. Yeah. Yeah, so, I, I have a question. Um, uh, can you comment a little bit on um, uncertainties in probabilistic modeling and, and how, uh, how that would integrate into your overall methodology? Because I could see many places that it could do it, uh, that it could integrate. So, I guess, so, can you comment on things like, you know, where it would, 
integrate how important you think it is and you know whether there's other people in the community also considering probabilistic models in their mm -hmm. formulations. Yeah. So here I didn't talk uh, really particularly about uh, <coughs> probabilistic models, but uh, in discrete event models, uh, uncertainty and probability distributions are uh, foundational there. So all the formalisms that I've talked about here are ready for, uh, for example, generating time advance functions in a probabilistic way, or uh, uh, yeah. And also, when we when we talk about constraints, those constraints, uh, those mathematical relations, so probability uh, density functions, for example, could be used in expressing the constraints as well. So, uh, so I didn't talk about that specifically, but of course, when we use it in real design, we need to have uh, probabilistic functions and handling uncertainty. The uh, example with the combat tours and the terrorist activity, were there probabilistic functions in those right. state diagrams? Um, yeah, not in the state diagrams, but actually when we look at the... Um, here. Um, here we had some... Uh, um, this model was generating uh, some values um, which are interpreted here as probabilities. So, for example, when a certain ideology is very strong in a community, then we generate a probability for each actor to, to commit some actions. So, for example, this model here is a probabilistic model. This one is deterministic, but we use uh, the values that are generated from this model to, to generate probabilities of action. Would, would there be an analytic approach to solving sort of an outcome? rather than just running Monte Carlo and, and just exhaustively trying to look at all the perturbations in the system? Um, are, are, yeah. are there people who approach this from an analytical perspective? Um, well, generally, in, in these types of systems, it's really difficult to have mathematical representations that you can solve analytically. So, generally, simulation... Because of the discrete. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, uh, I generally tell my students that simulation is a divide-and-conquer approach so you don't have a whole right so so you don't have a whole system representation that you can solve analytically but you have smaller uh, representations so you know how much time somebody will stay in a server you know for example when somebody else arrives in a, uh, in a queue it adds the queue to one so you have smaller analytical uh, functions that you can solve but you don't have the exhaustive Analytical function. Yeah, it's very quick to get to an exhaustive sort of uh, search that you can't possibly do that in optimization all the time. Do people use heuristics like genetic algorithms and, and these sorts of heuristic approaches to yeah. try and sample that exhaustive space that you know, yeah. we'd have to run simulations to where we retire to solve? <laughs> right. So, genetic algorithm, well, simulation generally is used for what if analysis. So, you create your model right. and you say, uh, what happens if I have this input? What output will be generated from this input? Um, whereas optimization will be used if you want not what if analysis, but what is the best set of parameters to achieve a certain uh, output. So these discrete simulation models are often used in combination with genetic algorithms or uh, uh, other optimization heuristics okay. to, to find the for example, the appropriate set of resources in a, in a factory, for example. So generally you have the model, you can use it for what-if analysis, but if you want to go to a precise solution, you can use optimization uh, techniques. Okay. Oliver? So you present a very good example of the simulation of the tram system in Shanghai. So what if, uh, say, uh, someone is going to do a simulation, not just the tram system, but the whole transparent system in Shanghai? Mm -hmm. What kind of extra effort would you expect? Right. You know, build upon this tram system, and then you have all this, you know, this road surface transportation. Right. With all the signals, and even like the maritime and the airport. Right. Um, so I would say uh, we would have to have this model and other models around it. So uh, um, I'm for actually integration of. Uh, like interoperation of models and not their integration. So if we put all of the transportation system in one model, it becomes 
a very big model that is not really understandable. So I would have a tram model, a bus model, and so on, and only make them interact at the points where they can influence each other. So actually in the same sense here, having a bridge model between them where they can exchange meaning at the right moments. Um, so, for example, one of our master students was working recently on extending that model with, uh, for example, the uh, pedestrian flows. So, uh, the city center will be very busy in, uh, at midday, for example, because people go out of the office to grab some, some lunch somewhere. And that has an impact on, uh, for example, when the tram arrives at a traffic light and people are pressing the crossing button. So if we don't have that um, pedestrian dynamics, our model is not as valid as it should be. So, but we didn't put that model inside the tram model. We created a pedestrian model on the side, and we created the appropriate connections between them. So, uh, yeah. So trying to find ways to bridge different models, I think that's a more effective strategy than making richer and richer models that become understood non-understandable at the end. Do you have uh, formal properties for your model? For example, you can view a model as a, as a machine for generating solutions to problems. Mm -hmm. And if you run your machine twice mm -hmm. on the same set of inputs, will the answer be the same? Right. This would be a property of uniqueness. Right. right. So that is, uh, but you those would... properties are guaranteed by the formalism. Uh, so if you, if you, so that's why actually it's important to have, uh, not to build models on top of Java directly, but having an abstract mathematical formalism on which you base your models. But so, I don't think it automatically comes from your formalism. Yeah. You, have to, you have to engineer them in the way you use your mix and match your formalism. You don't get uniqueness easily. It's hard to mm -hmm. get. Yeah. So, well, what about equivalence? Mm -hmm. If you make a model and I make a model and we claim they solve the same problem, will they give you the same answer? Well, yeah, if, if they are both valid, they should. Ah. But we, don't, we cannot know whether they are both valid, so... Uh, what, how do you know if they're valid? What's the test for validity? Well, yeah, different approaches. So most common uh, tests for validity are mainly data-driven validity, so generating data from the real system if it exists, uh, so black box testing and generating similar values from your model and doing statistical tests to see whether they compare uh, closely enough. So that would be one technique for validation. But you really don't have then um, a formal test for validity. You have to test and see the system and see if it gives the same results. Right. I see. Okay. Uh, well, we're rapidly losing our uh, <laughs> audience to other commitments. Uh, so again, could we thank our speaker? Uh